I'd like to generally address the question that we're often asked. You've probably wondered, why don't we have a Washington office? I think that uh, a policy institute, something like, we're, I guess you could say we're part of a policy institute, would have a Washington office, because that's, after all, where the politicians are, the people we need to influence. Um, will there ever come a time when we pack up and go? This happens all the time. You notice um, over the 1980s, there was a tremendous migration of, of uh, conservative periodicals and think tanks from the hinterlands into, into D.C. to achieve status. And, and uh, well, what they would always claim is that we're, we're anxious to um, heighten our influence. Um, and then, they, of course, they, they invariably make a promise that they will not go native, as they would put it. But, of course, in six months' time or so, they enter into the dangerous zone that I'm calling Washington Warp. They say first impressions are often the lasting ones, and especially when entering a new city. This is true. Arriving in D.C. for a journalism internship right out of college, I had an experience that not only made an impression, but summed up the whole of Capitol Hill's reason for existence. One summer afternoon, I walked up the street to a Chinese carryout uh, restaurant and walked back to my apartment with mugu gai pan in one hand and rice in the other, and my Texas-sized wallet sticking out of my back pocket. I heard footsteps behind me, felt a slight tug on my trousers, and turned to see a young boy of about 10 years old running away with my wallet in hand. I stood there confused. Finally, I yelled out at him something like, Hey, come back! <laughs> you can't take that from me. That's my wallet. I was raised in Lubbock, and the whole idea of public theft of another's property just didn't seem to fit with anything I had ever experienced. It was so brazen, so conspicuous, so fast, and so shameless. My first thought was, of course, to call the police. An idea that sent my roommates into hysterical laughs. They informed me that if I uh, was lucky enough to get a policeman on the phone, he would just wonder why I was wasting his time. He would say some perfunctory thing about putting it on the record and be done with it. But I asked, doesn't that mean that in the nation's capital, stealing another man's property with impunity is effectively legal? <laughs> and a more knowing roommate responded, you're getting the idea, Texas boy. <laughs> I had received my first lesson in D.C.-style microeconomics. Another time I was standing near a Mercedes that a passerby mistakenly thought was mine. I didn't have a car. Give me some money, he said with hostility. And I was confused at first, and then asked, why? <laughs> well, he said, look at your car. You've got lots of money. I don't have any. That was it. The welfare state had taught him well. <laughs> D.C. macroeconomics operates pretty much the same way. The ethic of theft is the defining cultural trait in a town that lives and thrives off $1.7 trillion it steals from the incomes of the American people every year. And along with that comes the ethic of the freebie. In fact, D.C. is a city filled with free stuff. It's a very strange thing that, um, that everybody who's spent any time there notices. That you don't have to live there long before you realize that it's, it's never necessary to buy a meal. You can attend a power breakfast, a Capitol Hill luncheon, and a think tank dinner virtually every day of the week. You can even take in an afternoon open bar if you're cocky enough. London has its high teas, but in D.C. it's scotch on the rocks at 3.30 sharp. What's more, you don't even have to be invited to enjoy all these freebies. So long as you look like you know what you're doing, you can go just about anywhere, except into the lobby, except beyond the lobby of the federal bureaucracy. All of them are closed off, especially to taxpayers. But since they don't have any premium booze and shrimp, nobody wants to be there anyway. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I had the occasion to go into a number of these. Uh, I, I understand that security has really been very much uh, enhanced in the years since I've left, but when I was there, you could you could go into places like uh, the Department of Transportation and uh, Health and Human Services and HUD. You could go in there if you had a researcher that would uh, in the department that would give you permission to come in. And from time to time, I was doing research on some subject and they would let me do it. it it's astonishing. You, you know, uh, I never imagined such a thing. 
I guess I had in my mind pictures uh, must have been taken in the 1950s from civics books in high school where they show the bureaus and everybody's hard at work um, serving the public. Um, but you know, you can walk through halls and halls and halls and, and that are completely empty. You poke your head in offices and nobody's there. Um, and the Department of uh, Health and Human Services one day I walked into, uh, went to, from office to office to office looking for somebody that will talk to me about something and uh, stumbled into, into a room with a large screen TV and, and there were uh, you know, probably 15 or 20 people just standing, sitting around watching it. That's what they were doing. And then over in the corners, you know, a few people flirting with each other and you know, a hostile lady behind some desk over here and nobody at the front desk. And, and I began to ask questions. Of course, nobody had any answers and nobody was interested in talking to me. And when you finally do find the guy who um, uh, gave you permission to come to the bureau, uh, he seems like a very lonely fellow. He's sitting there smoking a pipe and uh, sort of rather like a failed academic or something, and uh, anxious to see a fresh face, a, a person from the outside world that he could talk to and share uh, some of his knowledge. And very, you know, some of these people are quite bright, quite talented. Uh, their talents, uh, of course, entirely um, going to waste. From time to time at the Mises Institute, we get uh, we get calls from people inside bureaucracies that are passing on information to us are anxious to see something revealed to the public about a particular matter that we've covered in an op-ed or in uh, the free market or somewhere else. And over time, I developed a relationship, a kind of friendship with, a, with, a, um, with an economist who works at, I can't tell you, actually, but a, uh, a, a powerful bureau in Washington, a high-level official. Um, so he began to tell me a little bit about his life, and um, I encouraged him to write an essay on the subject, and the result was an article that appeared about two years ago called, what was the name of that article? <coughs> anyway, it was by Mr. X. I had uh, something like the life of a DC bureaucrat, and he wouldn't give his name, he wasn't able to give his name, he just called himself Mr. X, and he, he talked about, um, he said, he said, you know, I have a PhD in economics, and I have some ability, and truly, I'm a sympathetic pathetic to the Austrian school. That's what I care about most. I can't stand the government. I believe me, working for it makes you hate it all the more. And uh, uh, my, said, but I have one, one key problem in my life. I have many virtues, but, but one, of them, one of my virtues is not that I like to work. In fact, I'm quite lazy. I'm lazier than anybody I know, he says. <laughs> and I got out of graduate, got my PhD, and this job was here. And um, I got on the endless cycle of uh, of uh, you know, higher and higher salaries the longer you stay around and higher and higher ranks within the civil, civil service. And really, I just can't leave. I, frankly, I love my life. He, ex he explained how, how um, uh, he and his wife uh, might as well be retired for all the, uh, the vacation time that they have. He said that um, quite often he will um, you know, come to work at uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock and leave pretty quickly for a jog, uh, uh, run home, take a shower, uh, come back to the office for a few minutes, uh, go to the grocery store afterwards. And he says, of course, all of this is in violation of the official regulations of the, of the bureaucracy. Um, the problem is that, um, you know, since everybody else is doing it, there's no reason for anyone to turn anybody else in. Whistleblower is a very rare thing in the Washington bureaucracy. After we ran that Mr. X article, which is one of, one of the funniest articles I, think, articles I think we've ever published, he, um, uh, we got just inundated with letters from, from uh, public service unions that were, that were claiming that this article was a complete fake, that it was a fraud, and we had made it up ourselves. I had all the documentation on it, but uh, I never answered these letters. Anytime I had guests come into D.C. when I was there, I'd take them on a tour. I, I like to call it the Truth in Government Tour. <laughs> I took them to the Vietnam Memorial, of course. That's, a, that's an, ama an, an amazing experience. I encourage you to go. Um, I explained the true meaning behind the statue in front of the Federal Trade Commission, which I won't tell you about now, but I'm glad to tell you about in private. Um, I dragged people to a random subcommittee meeting to show them how inane the process of government truly is, and thank goodness for uh, C-SPAN, uh, which, which now airs these things for the, for the entire nation. I'd take them to HUD and show them uh, the Department of Labor and explain that unlike Congress, these are the institutions that are actually running the country on a daily basis. And I'd take them to the several palaces of the World Bank and the IMF and told them of the employees' high, very high, and untaxed salaries. 
take them to the Iwo Jima Memorial, which has every um, country the U.S. has ever invaded etched around the sides. It's a startling list. And if you ever doubt that the U.S. is an empire, take a look at that. I showed them the quotation blazoned on top of the IRS, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. And that always brings a great laugh. What never failed to make the largest impression were the receptions. The receptions which are elaborate, decadent, and most importantly, free to anyone with an attitude. This just doesn't happen in the real world. And D.C. is a very, very strange place, uh, quite unlike any other in the rest of the country. For example, not many people know that, that uh, when I was there, you could drink the water. This is a great luxury. Nowadays, you cannot drink the water in D.C. It's unsafe. You have to buy bottled water. It's like the third world. As a matter of fact, um, Christopher Hitchens reports on the new Vanity Fair that uh, the potholes in D.C. are a favorite joke among foreign diplomats who gaily compare conditions in Cairo or Kinshasa and other hardship postings you know, to, to D.C. He says, when my son tested positive for TB, an affliction I thought had been banished roughly when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, I resolved to do some unsmiling research and found that as a result of uh, that, as of the latest annual federal figures, TB cases in Washington had increased 36% as against the decline of 7% in the rest of the United States. Just one other small anecdote. The other day, the post office of the 14th Street in Irving uh, Northwest had to be closed because rodents were devouring the mail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's very common. Um, everybody knows what a horrible place D.C. is and the squalor. It's really astonishing. And I often lo- like to take guests by Anastas- uh, um, Anna- Anacosta, uh, which really is to look like a third, a third world. Uh, but at the common line that you hear all the time from, from congressmen and from, from apologists of, of the D.C. culture is that, look, this is Mayor Barry. You know, there's nothing the federal government can do about it. This guy is a crook and a criminal, and he's running the town under the ground, and, and that's it. Um, well, a couple of things to say about this. Um, just as an aside, by the way, I, I actually met Mayor Barry, and, uh, and you, wouldn't, you can't get this. It's sort of like Clinton. You can't get it from the television cameras, but he's actually very impressive looking man, and he's got sort of star quality. As soon as I met him, I realized how he was able to win re-election, no matter what kind of scandals uh, surround him. But it's just not true to say that the District of Columbia government is somehow responsible for what's going on in D.C. I mean, this is a city that has benefited from more, I don't want to say benefited, but it has been the beneficiary of more federal subsidies than any other in the country. It is more micromanaged and historically has always been by the federal government than any other city, and look like results. Now, this is, this is a, a catastrophe. I, it seems to me we ought to make a deal with, um, with the government that says something like, like this. Look, if you think you can run the country, if you can, if you can put together a central plan that's going to bring us utopia, fine, we'll give you that power, but first do it in D.C. Make this the model city, and then you know, we'll think about letting you do it to the rest of the country. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the worst city in the country. Uh, last year, Congress took over the government of the District of Columbia, and Newt Gingrich uh, made it his personal mission <laughs> to uh, to make the nation's capital, what else, uh, a shining city on the hill. So we're, we're, we'll uh, we'll see how he does. There's much about Capitol Hill that runs contrary to the rest of the country. For example, in a regular job market, your wages and salary are linked to how much you contribute to the overall productivity of the firm. Your future job prospects are determined how well you do at your present one. Uh, Leftists have long denounced the supposed good old boys network that determines who who gets what jobs in the private market, but as we all know, knowing the right person can only get you so far in the private sector. It won't make a millionaire out of an incompetent unless, of course, the EEOC is pulling the strings with the threat of a class action lawsuit. But in D.C., the Good Old Boys Network is really all that does exist. In fact, um, uh, getting head is about who you know, and almost exclusively so. And that's why uh, the idea of networking, this 80s phrase that came about, is such a crucial part of the daily life of a Capitol Hill groupie. But this reality eventually takes its toll on people's sense of themselves, knowing that it's not their productivity and talents that account for their position, uh, Connections and who you know comes to define who you are and what you are. You hone your socializing skill, your ability to drop names, your titles, your inside information, and you do this most of the waking day. And in the struggle for social status, 
And DC position trumps productivity every time. So who is this typical Capitol Hill groupie? He's a person who hates his hometown and works to banish all traces of regionalism from his manner. He sneers at the political ignorance of his parents, but loves nothing better than telling them what is really going on in the Hill, since, of course, he has inside information. The media is always uh, denouncing the supposed cynicism of the American public, but let me tell you, uh, there is no cynicism to compare with the double-edged uh, anger and uh, deeply cynical worldview of a typical DC hack. Uh, there are no idealists here, and everyone knows it's a racket, but approves of it nonetheless. The typical Capitol Hill group, he doesn't believe that someday he'll be running Capitol Hill because, you know, truthfully, he's already convinced that he does. He believes that without his vital contribution, no matter how petty and irrelevant it is, that the whole place would fall apart in an instant. It's, uh, it's an intoxicating atmosphere, and, and, and the drug is power. I once knew an aide to an aide to an aide of the Secretary of HUD, who was then Jack Kemp, but from his manner you would have thought that he had founded Microsoft. <laughs> That's a very widespread attitude. At the Mises Institute, we've learned that there are two types of phone manners. There's human phone manners, in which people call you up and ask for materials and thank you when you send it to them. And there's DC phone manners, where people call up and demand everything immediately expect to pay nothing, and then act like they've done you a favor. What is it that accounts for this, for this attitude? I think it's really the sense that, that nearly everyone within the Beltway has that uh, they sit in an exalted place in the universe, that their place is secure, and that outsiders therefore have no choice but to deal with you. And in a sense, it is true that their place is secure. You know, DC never really goes through a recession for example, because, because the place is run by tax, tax dollars. Uh, the first lesson anyone learns in Washington, besides the importance of not walking at night with both arms full of Chinese food, <laughs> is that a principled stand on behalf of some policy matter will get you nowhere but down. Of course, it's permissible to make a principled statements when the television cameras are rolling uh, or when the Post, Washington Post is on the other end of the phone, profiling you from the style section. But let's not pretend that this is real. Everybody knows that... Um, that uh, it, it's, it's all just fun and games. Um, people with principles are treated as well by Washington political culture as whistleblowers are treated by the bureaucracy. To be principled in Washington is to expose yourself as an outsider, a man with no influence and no friends, a person who will soon be leaving town. A phrase you often hear is this, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's the way the official culture slaps down um, idealists. And with that phrase, every manner of duplicity and dissembling is given a philosophical sounding justification. You learn to never tell the truth, you never let learn you learn to never let the truth get in the way of a believable justification for selling out. Now, in the campaign finance hearings this, this past year and in this past week, Republicans kept hollering about how the Clinton campaign accepted contributions from businesses and individuals with a quid pro on a quid pro quo basis. The number of favors this administration does you, uh, they claim, is directly proportional to the extent that you fund their party machine. And I kept thinking, do these guys really think that we are so stupid as to believe this is an aberration? I mean, th this isn't a campaign finance scandal at all. This is called public policy. And of course, eventually, uh, the Republicans agreed and dropped the whole matter. Um, recall that uh, during the heady days when people were denouncing the so-called corruption of government, where people pay for favors from the government, at the same time, Microsoft was being berated because uh, of its arrogance for only having two lobbyists in D.C. My goodness, a company of that size should have an entire team, should have 15, 20, 30, 40. What else do they expect? Of course, they're going to get in trouble. You have to, uh, you have to pay off the right people in order to have a free way uh, in the marketplace. And this is coming from uh, very respectable commentators who are making this kind of critique, so-called critique of Microsoft. No doubt D.C. is an imperial city founded on theft, sustained by lies, but sometimes you have to wonder, how does, how does it all work? Why do its victims put up with it? And that boy who stole my wallet, for example, was never apprehended, but surely we can all agree that he, what he did was wrong. How is it that D.C. can accomplish uh, the uh, not just petty theft, but grand larceny on an unimaginably huge scale, uh, but the whole town not be apprehended? How can the criminal state be so brazen, so conspicuous, so shameless? I think Lou uh, touched on the idea last night. It lies in the rationales used to cover up the essential immoral character of what is going on. 
if a gang of thieves suddenly announces it's to a productive nation of 250 million people that wanted to, they wanted 1.7 trillion dollars by the year end, years end, for no good reason, the gang would be ignored or rounded up and dealt with soundly. But if those thieves convince you that they are necessary for your well-being, that they are providing you essential services, that they're contributing to the overarching moral climate, holding society intact, keeping polar caps from melting, <laughs> making the economy run right, representing the people, whatever the racket is, becomes a little bit um, more plausible. Um, in the 19th century, there were there were no think tanks. And by the way, the uh, the, this is why it's necessary for government to have an intellectual basis, to have a, a group of intellectuals to explain and justify what's going on all the time. Other, otherwise, the thing wouldn't work. In the 19th century, when government was relatively small, there were no think tanks in Washington devoted to pursuing public policy research. There was no uh, occupation called a public policy analyst in D.C. palaces where people could live, uh, make a living doing this sort of thing. Uh, the biggest one-time explosion in state power obviously occurred with Lincoln, and though his primary intention was invading the South, uh, and invading the South was to collect the tariff, as Charles Adams has shown, he weaved an elaborate tale about the desire to set slaves free and keep the Union intact uh, in order to mask his real purposes. But by the Progressive Era, uh, new rationales for state power had, had grown and become far more sophisticated. Now the government needed to exist and expand the pursuit of a social science in the name of uh, government management. That's the phrase public policy for the first time was born. And what is this thing called public policy? It was supposed to be some third path beyond pure scholarship and, and mere political agitation. Its purpose was to put a smooth and respectable gloss on a power grab uh, to achieve social management in the name of science. And the nation's first think tank, in fact, was founded at the height of the Progressive Era in 1916 as the Institute for Government Research. It was initially funded entirely by the Rockefeller Foundation to carry out the dreams of the Ivy League political science profession for scientific public policy. Here's how the Institute for Government Research came about. In uh, President William Howard Taft's administration, uh, a group of these pro progressive political science and municipal reformers uh, were charged with a way of coming up with uh, improving data collection techniques. Data collection is a, a central function of the modern state. Uh, this commission recommended that Congress form a consolidated information and statistical arm of the entire national government. That's a quote. And at the heart of this statistical arm would be the budget division that would uh, present a, quote, annual program of business for the federal government to be financed by Congress, unquote. A bill was drafted, it went to Congress, but Congress said no way, and deep-sixed the whole idea on grounds that it seemed absurdly socialistic. Disgruntled members of the committee set up the Institute for Government Research, and later a certain St. Louis industrialist, uh, an educator, took over the job of financing it. His name was Robert S. Brookings, after whom the Institute for Government Research was eventually renamed to become the Brookings Institution. Now, the reason I tell the story of the Brookings Institution is to to, to uh, show that, that the, the relationship between a think tank in Washington and the government has always been intensely close. It can't really be any other way. Uh, that's always been the function of uh, public policy research institutes. And, and uh, to some extent that's, well, to a very large extent that survives to today. The story of Mr. Brookings itself is fascinating in its own right. In World War I, he was called to Washington to be the commissioner of finished products and chairman of the Price Fixing Committee on the War Industries Board. In short, it was a, he was a central planner on the totalitarian model, a man who hoped that many more could follow him and enjoy the thrill of fixing other people's prices and running the economy into the ground. So from its inception, the idea of the think tank was that it would serve the cause of government, working as government's research arm and serving as a way station for political appointees and civil servants as they moved in and out of office. And while they're in office, they operate the mechanisms of power, and while they're out of office sitting at the think tank, they cheer on those who operate the mechanisms of power and feed them data. Brookings served this function of shoring up the imperial state, and giving a scientific gloss for a very long time, and in the meantime, uh, the, the next... Uh, research institutes to be founded was the Council on Foreign Relations, which handled the foreign policy side of, uh, of, um, of, um, of uh, government policy, and then finally the National Bureau for Economic Research, which handled economic policy. The premise of all three of these organizations was inherently illiberal. Society cannot run itself, they believed. It needs top-down rule of an extremely smart, well-trained, public-spirited intellectuals from very good families to do it uh, for them. 
With the founding of the American Enterprise Institute in 1942, the think tank culture took a slightly partisan turn, a partisan spin. And over time, Brookings functioned as a Democrats think tank, and AEI served as the Republicans think tank. In those days, there was a revolving door between the regime and the White House and its political appointees and the think tanks which housed them in the off years. Now, as the years have gone by, the rationale for why a think tank is in Washington has slightly changed. It's no longer that uh, the think tank serves as the, the, uh, the core intellectual basis for justifying the regime in all respects. After all, D.C. is a highly partisan culture, so virtually every think tank, and there are tens of thousands of them, um, are allied with one force or the other. This has an unfortunate um, side effect, though. It... <coughs> It creates the impression, or it rests on the assumption that D.C. is a big, uh, um, th that it's a big debating club. That if we all just sort of go there and throw our two, sen two cents in, what will eventually emerge is a wonderful policy consensus around, around which the rest of the, the country can, uh, can rally. Um, and this, this is the problem with, this is a particular problem for those of us who want to cut government. When you, when you come to Washington, you essentially have to play this game. You have to, uh, you have to embrace this policy debating society model of, of the central state. Uh, the problem with, the, the core problem with it is that it masks the essential reason for why government exists, namely to exercise power. And let's be perfectly clear on, on one thing. There is no room in D.C. for a seriously thriving intellectual culture any more than there was an intellectual culture in Moscow under Stalin, in Berlin under the Nazis, or Beijing under Mao. In the centers of power, bad ideas drive out good ones, or more clearly still, power is the enemy of honest thinking. The most absurd attempt recently to portray D.C. as a... Um, debating side society occurred recently when Clinton was encouraging us to have a national dialogue on race. The implication is somehow that he is open to every point of view and just needs to be persuaded by the voices of reason. In fact, Clinton is head of a totalitarian racial project, and uh, he's sort of like the robber asking his victims, you know, to enter into a dialogue about the merits of mugging or something. There, there can be no dialogue when the power relations are so seriously skewed in one direction. Um, I've known many men, young men, who are extremely bright, young men and women who are extremely bright, and uh, have a passion for ideas, and, and also even Australian economics, go into Washington uh, policy society with great hopes and get chewed up, and uh, either leave or stay uh, completely compromised. And I think it's a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous tragedy. And anytime I have a chance to encourage people not to go, I do so. Um, when you're there, it doesn't take long, but uh, whatever idealism you enter the city with, it becomes it just ends up being banished from your from your brain. You grow older, you grow wiser, so-called. Uh, you understand the whole thing is a racket after all. It's pointless to, but you also understand it's pointless to call for serious change. You become part of the crowd, hoping someday you will rise above it by being more cynical, more manipulative, more pushy, and overall much worse human being than your peers. The worst rise to the top says Hayek and you're going to make darn sure that you get there earlier than anyone else. This is a very typical attitude. Um, it's very interesting to see uh, Clinton, when he went into, into the White House, drew in a lot of people from New York and, and uh, um, Arkansas, a lot of more young idealists. I mean, they don't hold our views, but they did have uh, you know, very, uh, you know, they had uh, basically you know, many, many socialists that he, he brought in around his administration. Over the course of the years, of course, they've... Um, They've given up any kind of hope of a uh, you know, serious revolution. They're just enjoying the, the process of, of, of exercising power. I was intrigued the other day to watch that Ohio demonstration, knowing that you know, many employees of the White House know with, for a fact that, if, that uh, if they were younger and they had been in college, they would have been one of the protesters. Instead, they're on the other side. It doesn't bother them. Same thing happened to the Reagan White House. I also once knew a famous uh, and very good economist who made a name for himself arguing against a particular version of the tax reform for five years. I don't want to tell you which version it is because you might know who he is. He was slaying his opponents in the worst way, becoming a one-man army against this particular brand of tax reform. And he did this for five years. and finally drove the opposition to take a very extreme step. They decided to hire him. And after which time he changed his mind and uh, wrote in favor of the other tax reform. Very, very common. D.C. policy culture has the effect of turning people into secret anarchists or secret totalitarians, and the anarchists eventually move to Seattle or to Auburn. <laughs>
A picture that has never left my mind and one of my happiest memories from Washington is from mid-November 1992. It was a gathering of Bush administration employees in, far, in far-flung sectors of the executive branch along with their cohorts in various Republican think tanks and bureaus. It was supposed to be a ball. The mirror lights turned and the band played and the champagne bubbled from the fountain, but the 300 or so people present were leaning against the walls, nursing their hard liquor, and wondering what to do with their lives. They sensed that something far more dramatic than a lost election had occurred. The Cold War was over and the Gulf War was already a distant memory, and there was little left for them to do, little left for Washington to do. They no longer had a stake and no longer had saw much of a point, and I, at that moment, uh, very grateful for what remains of the spoils system. For these people in this room, the party was over. That night, several marital engage exa engagements were announced. Others uh, muttered about going home to mom and dad. A few talked about starting their own consulting business, which in D.C. is code for being unemployed. And thank goodness, uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was just a thrilling thing to see. At last, this entire crew had been dethroned. Their power, their contacts, their social status was all in tatters. Complete, uh, completely destroyed. And of course the looting hasn't stopped in the meantime, a, a new group of, uh, of uh, people rose to take their place, but it was no longer, they no longer have that high-minded purpose that it once had. Clinton has a hard time retaining employees, for example. Those who used to work worry about turnover in Congress no longer do. The civil service is seen as best people bought off by the private sector, and those who remain are demoralized. Worse, nobody seems to care. So, you know, it, it's not possible to think straight on Capitol Hill, is the bottom line. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, it literally takes over your brain, uh, becomes a part of your life. Most of the creative thought going on in this country is occurring outside of Washington. Um, uh, the Manhattan Institute, for example, is in, uh, we don't always agree with what they say, but far more creative, far more creative intellectually than, than its counterparts in D.C. Those who are going to make a difference in our future live far, far away. Thank you.